Hey legends, welcome back to the channel. A bit of a different one this week. Uh, just doing a bit of a Q and A. I keep getting lots of questions, can't keep up with the answers. So I thought I'd just nail a few here because a lot of them are common questions. So I've tried to cover the ones that I get asked the most uh, through the episodes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's obviously finished. You can see behind me there, we've just done a bit of a shakedown trip uh, out into the bush, which is uh, which went really well. A couple of minor roadside repairs, which you'll see in the episode. But apart from that, she was uh, fully functional and great. So. Pretty happy with that. Uh, I've already got three more trips planned already. Uh, some pretty exciting destinations too to, to show you with the um, with the van. I haven't gone off-road with it. I'm gonna give it some blacktop experience for a while, maybe a few dirt tracks here and there, but I'm not gonna go too crazy until I'm really confident that it's uh, structurally sound. Uh, and then we'll get out in the bush proper. Um, yeah, but stay tuned. A uh, bit of a quick episode today as well. We'll smash through these questions and uh, and then we'll be back to the normal build series straight after that. Cheers. Uh, Daryl asked, uh, if you had your time again, uh, what's the number one thing you uh, would do differently? <laughs> there's probably about, I don't know if there's a number one, there's probably about 10 things, if I'm honest. Uh, I don't like this arrangement in the end um, with the two doors there like that. I think I should have just made one big one and then made some other arrangement for a shelf to come out like a slide out. Um, shelf uh there's just too many cutouts on the side of the van i think we'll see how that goes over time but i also do not like the uh, big wide extrusion i'm going to try and cover that up in a future episode you'll probably see some sort of mod coming through with that um either paint or a wrap over the whole thing i'm not really sure yet we'll figure that out later but yeah i don't like that i would go a narrower profile if it was available or make my own or cut these ones down like i did for the fridge slide area uh so there's two the other one is welding the chassis I'd take it a bit slower, um, invest a bit more money in uh, welding effort and slow the whole process down and go from one end to the other and, and zigzag across and so on to make sure that I didn't get any bowing or warping. I don't think that's gonna cause me any issues later on, but that was one of the bigger ones at the start that uh, kept me awake for a few nights after it had finished, uh, wondering how I was gonna remedy that, but yeah, all good in the end. Daryl also asked, uh, how many trips to Bunnings did you do? Oh, mate, I, I, I actually don't want to know because it was crazy. Um, some weekends I had there three or four times because I'm so disorganised and I'd, I'd actually write a list, get there, walk out of the place, drive home and then realise I'd missed three things on the list. Um, so it's, yeah, they literally know me on first name basis, which is hilarious, uh, even though there's probably about 100 staff there. I reckon pretty much everyone knows who I am now. Uh, and even like on the very last day before the shakedown tour, you can see she's finished in the back, by the way. Um, yeah, the very last day before the shakedown tour, I had I went there four times, twice in the morning, twice in the afternoon. Uh, it's a 10 minute drive, certainly choose into your day. I reckon probably the most frequent question I get asked literally, uh, four or five times each weekend when I throw links up on Facebook and stuff to the, um, to the trailer building type groups um, and particularly from the guys over in the US I think this this product's not very uh, prevalent over there so it's a the walls are made out of this which is a fiberglass composite um, so you can see there there's a fiberglass skin on either side of the um, foam core so that the skin on these you can get them at different thicknesses but these are 1.6 um, either side so that gives you 3.2 mil and then the core is 25 so it ends up being 28.2 mil thick um, the, you can strengthen this stuff with, uh, various, various methods. You can put, um, pretty much anything inside them before they, when they're manufactured and pulled together. I've gone with a PVC material. Uh, I don't think I've got any examples of that at hand, but it's just a piece of, uh, thick plastic that runs through in spots where I wanted to strengthen the, strengthen the build. I've covered this in a few episodes, but obviously, um, not everyone goes and watches all of the episodes. So, uh, yeah, so fiberglass composite material, 28.2 mil thick. Uh, I love it. It's really easy to work with. Uh, it's lightweight, it's very strong. Uh, it's insulating and um, you can get the whole thing done with a CNC machine. So I got this gear from Transform RV in uh, Melbourne. Uh, Vince and the crew down there, yeah, really good outfit. Um, highly recommend them. Another question about the panels I, I get a bit is um, from the episode where I was trying, trying not to uh, herniate a disc in my back lifting the uh, panels up onto the frame to glue them in the, the outside wall panels that is but just with this again the uh core so that's actually a cut out from the windows um you can see the little little tags on there that was all that was holding those in um and i left those in when i was standing the walls up 
obviously that made it way more um, because it was still had all those panels in. I could have taken them out before erecting the wall. I just wanted to, I wasn't sure about the strength of the panels and flex and everything else. If I'd taken them out, I was trying to lift it, would I have snapped a wall? Probably not in hindsight, but um, I didn't herniate a disc either, so I think we had the best outcome. <laughs> A couple of people have asked why why I put two sinks in the kitchen. Uh, you would have seen that in a previous episode. Um, it's a good question, probably a bit over the top really, um, but road testing it for the first time the other day and um, one of the sinks is just a general sink area, washing dishes, doing all that sort of stuff. The other sink, I've now got a plastic strainer that just coincidentally fitted perfectly in that sink and this was the plan sort of. Uh, so I could be at camp, have breakfast, wash dishes, wash the dishes before we take off to the next site, drop all the um, plates and bowls and stuff into that dish rack, and then that's obviously draining to grey water, so I don't have to worry about, you know, everything drying and, and, and putting it away in the cupboard. I can just chuck it in that dish drain, and that's what I basically do, really. <laughs> I found in the five-day camp we just did, we were living out of the drain, so they're getting washed or in the drain, so we didn't even get stuff out of the cupboard, it just lived in that, that sink, so it's been useful. Absolutely necessary, no. Uh, complicating the process, yes. Uh, Kelvin asked about the wall assembly and any recommendations on how to glue it um, together and, and I think with reference mainly to how I held it in place while the glue dried. Uh, 100 mile an hour tape is useful and uh, very strong and um, is, is part of that process, I think, should be part of that process. Uh, clamps I used quite a bit, and but you've got to be careful with the clamps in my opinion. If you pull them up too tight, you're going to squeeze all the glue out and your strength as well then goes with it. So I only put them on softly in spots in strategic locations um, and made sure I still had a fair bit of glue. You know, you want to leave a good millimetre in there I'd say, uh, at least just to get the adhesion. So yeah, 100 mile an hour tape and clamps, uh, depending on your application. Clamps also I needed to use to pull in the wall in certain spots where there might have been a slight anomaly in something and I just wanted to straighten things up so they're useful for that as well. Daryl asked uh, what mods I've done since the maiden voyage. Actually today, this weekend, is the first weekend after maiden voyage. Oh, I did take it on a few trips but not. I didn't stay anywhere for a lengthy period of time so last weekend, uh, last week was the maiden voyage really so I haven't done any mods since then. I did break the fridge slide when I got home which is great so I've got to fix that. Um, a little uh, modification I did to that broke off. <laughs> so I've got to fix that, that'll be the first mod. I've got to put the kitchen cupboards, uh, you can see the kitchen in the back there, there's where I'll put a little plates and bowls and all that sort of stuff. Um, needs a rethink and uh, yeah, I've got to put some shelves in, so I'll probably do that today. Uh, I've got to get some chargers inside because my phone's always flat, um, all, the, all the gear's always flat, good to be able to plug that in when you go to sleep. Um, I've got to get lights on the outside. I've got no lights under the awning, so I was using like battery operated lights, which were um, rubbish. And um, I've got all this Terralume gear there to throw up and I just haven't got around to it yet. So that'll be on the list as well before I go next time. Uh, Sipper, he asked, uh, now that I've built it and I know about the build process and the price and the cost of, of materials and the effort and everything else, do I think that off, um, you know, purchased vans off the market are a reasonable price? Um, you know, justifiable price, I guess. That's uh, that's a yes and no answer. I I think there's some really good quality vans out there that you pay a premium for, that are probably worth the money. But you know, it's no guarantee of quality, from what I can tell. It seems like the industry's gone to a big volume-based outcome rather than a quality-based outcome. There's a few manufacturers out there that are just knocking them out of the park. Some really good high-quality vans, but you absolutely pay through the nose for them. So. Um, the biggest deciding factor for me around building this actually was the um, time frame to wait for a new van. It was a 12 to 18 months minimum when I inquired. And um, I reckon I did this for a third of the price is my, my view. Um, when you start looking at things like airbag suspension, you know, Victron panel setup, 1000 watts of solar, um, composting toilets, and you start adding all those things as extras on top of your, your your base build cost. I'm easily at a third, you know, maybe a half on some models, but um, I reckon that's justif justification in itself. Whether the durability of this will be as good or will last over time or the functionality of it over time, I don't know. Well, time will tell, I guess, but the process has been pretty enjoyable, fairly stressful at times, but uh, oh, would I do it again? <laughs> that's a big wood uh, question. I don't know. Uh, 
I don't think I've got it in me. Plus, all the rules changing, I don't know what's going to happen around ability to build your own van and get it registered uh, in the future. Um, once the feds take over that process, uh, time will tell. You know, never say never. I've had a few people ask me, do I make any money out of YouTube? No, I don't. <laughs> it's a big love job at the moment. Uh, there's a few few criteria you need to meet to start making money out of YouTube, if you don't know. There's a, you gotta get to a thousand subscribers, which I've done a few weeks ago or a month ago now, so that's great. Uh, we've hit that milestone. Uh, you've, not, you've got to not break any YouTube rules. We've got copyright infringement and all rules and all that sort of stuff, um, so I don't break any of those. Um, so I've, there's three, there's four things you need to do. I've done three of them. The fourth one is you've got to have 4,000 watch hours. Uh, so uh, the viewership's got to be up around that number and then you trip over that and you get into this thing called monetization and um, YouTube pays the creator for uh, every time someone watches an ad at the start of the video. I'm told it's pretty ordinary uh, payback, uh, virtually nothing to be honest, um, at, at the sort of views that I'm getting on videos. but over time, who knows, it may grow. I, had, I didn't really do this for the money, if I'm honest. Uh, it was a bit of a fun exercise, and if it gets payback later on, um, I think the best outcome I could get is that it pays for the actual fuel on the trips I do or something like that would be useful. Um, so, yeah, I'm at, I don't know, I'm about, I reckon by the end of this Q&A episode, I reckon I'll hit the 4,000 hours. So feel free to get your kids' iPads, <laughs> put the playlist on and just hit play all endlessly every day for uh, weeks. That'd be fantastic. Thanks everyone. Oh, I've had a few comments about the composting toilet over time and uh, what I think about it. I'm sitting on it now, obviously. Um, I've only road tested it for the one trip. We did five days, three three people, and uh, it was great. Like it worked perfectly in all respects, but um, I've noticed the one thing I, <laughs> I didn't even think about when I got back is the fans on all the time, right? Well, there's two things. The fan's on all the time. It actually, you know, people say it doesn't make any noise, but I can hear it at night. So I'm gonna have to like somehow insulate um, sound dead and around it or something because I don't like the noise. I'd rather hear nature. So that's one thing to consider. The other one is I park the van in the shed when I get back and uh, that fan's blowing beautifully uh, scented air all around the shed. So you walk in, you get a bit of a oof. Um, I know that'll dissipate as the composting process starts and it's only probably when we landed back from the trip for the first time. Um, so hopefully that improves. I actually just walked in this morning a few days later and it doesn't smell. So yeah, but that is one thing to consider. You've got a fruity shed for a couple of days after you get back. Uh, I forgot to mention while sitting in there, someone asked actually what brand that toilet is. A couple of times I've been asked that. It's an Airhead, US company, uh, took forever to turn up. Um, I, you know, it's well made, it's good quality, absolutely. I, I reckon they're really overpriced for what they are. Uh, I think there's probably an opportunity for someone to intercept that market in Australia in the caravan industry and make something that's pretty straightforward. It is just a, it's got no moving parts other than that rotating handle and it's just a plastic molded product basically um, with a fan that you can put in and it's just a computer fan. So they're, you know, for the price, which was a lot, I'm thinking closer to 2000 than 1000 I can't exactly remember, but it was, yeah, crazy price. Um, I am going to do a full episode actually on uh the installation start to finish so it's all in one place because a lot of people ask about how to put one of these in so i'll do one which just cuts all that footage together and makes it one and then do a bit of a review at the end as well of how it's been going uh, i'll probably do that in a couple of months time lots of questions about the victron gear uh episode 18 i'm going to go through the installation of all the electrical um so that you'll see a fair bit of that then when we get there. But a lot of people just asking how it's performing. It's an absolute weapon. I love it so much. Uh, I've gone way over the top. I understand that with the with the blue gear. Um, I've probably done a setup that's good enough for a house. But uh, it's interesting. I did the shakedown tour, as uh, you'll see that in episode 20 when it turns up. Um, and I tested out a bit. I had really overcast conditions and using all electrical uh, electric cooking basically um, and I tested it like it you know it got down pretty low on the battery levels at times um, so there's there's definitely a balance of what I need to do and 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 um, how I position the van to get the best sun and all that sort of stuff that I'll have to consider moving forward but for now I love it to two bits yeah some people have asked about the layout and what I think about it and whether it's functional um, it's it's good. There's things that definitely improve. You can see that massive bed there. Sorry, there's all kids' dooners and everything thrown on there at the moment. But 
that window at the back there is the same height as the top of the mattress and um, it's plenty of room in that bed and head height and everything else. I've got no issues with that. It's actually really functional in terms of the space, but that window being there means that, you know, you've got pillows pushing up against um, fly screens or whatever, um, or the block out blind. And if you haven't got those up or down, then obviously you've got light coming in. So um, it's, you know, I, I, I want that window there because you want the cross ventilation, absolutely. So that's um, important, just have to be careful about placement of pillows and and um, not pushing on that fly screen to break it, I guess. It hasn't, I haven't had any issues yet with the first trip, but uh, if I had my time again, well, actually, I did have my time again. Uh, the van was supposed to be 200 mils longer, but I screwed up when I was building it. I don't know if I've explained this before in the video, but the, the bumper bar was supposed to be uh, 200 mils longer, and I measured off SketchUp, came out, started cutting steel, welding, and put it on. Then I realized I'd made it 200 mils too short. So the back of the van had to come in that far, which was the little bed heady shelf thing that I'd planned at the end of the queen bed there um, to uh, A, use as a sort of a place to put phones and books and things, and B, stop the pillows from hitting the window. So that was a bit of a stuff up on my behalf. So I've had my time again. We probably stretched the van a little bit. Had this question a bit. Uh, Wayne asked what, how I've attached the internal walls, uh, how are they fixed and so on. Are they screwed or glued or both? Uh, the pure light panel is, uh, has really good screw retention, um, but I have glued them all and, and I've used screws. Honestly, that's probably more to hold it in place when it, when it glue dried, but uh, it does give it a bit of strength as well. So I've left them in. I actually need to cover them all up with a trim of some sort. I haven't got around to that yet. Um, yeah, so glued and screwed, um, also where I could hide it, I put aluminium angle on that interface. Um, so pretty much, pretty much every intersection actually has got a bit of aluminium on it in some capacity. Uh, and I will put, probably put an aluminium angle trim if I can find something I like on all of the, uh, exposed surfaces now that have screws in them inside just to make that edge look neat, but also again, to give it a bit more strength potentially, uh, where the where the pure light intersects the external wall, it's only glued and because um, I'm not drilling through from the outside into that wall, into that pure light panel, obviously through the outside wall. Uh, so that's glued. And also again, wherever that meets, I've, um, I've put a bit of aluminium angle where you could hide it, uh, which is again, a lot of the surfaces actually have got a piece of aluminium um, inside cupboards and all that sort of stuff to try and strengthen that again. So, cause there's another extra piece of surface area for the, uh, MS 939 to cure, uh, against and put some strength on. So Lewis asked, uh, how solid does the bed frame feel once it being just sickered in? Um, you might've seen in that episode that I, I glued the frame in around the outside perimeter. Um, maybe I didn't show up, but also there's, uh, aluminium angle, screwed along uh, the internal panels and the external walls. I put a bit of aluminium uh, glued around the um, perimeter as well, so that holds it up. But the other thing that gives it most of its strength, honestly, is I've got that uh, Victron panel mount um, frame. So there's a steel frame that goes in under the bed frame there that sits pretty much in the center of the bed. Um, so it acts as a full support right in the center. So it actually free stands there, uh, resting on that. So the outside perimeter is really just to stop it moving around and give it a bit more strength as well. So I think she's pretty solid. Uh, road tested it. Uh, just got back from the maiden voyage, as I mentioned, and uh, it was fine. Like, didn't move at all. Don't think it's going to move ever again. So all good. So I'll call it a day on the episode there. Thanks for dialing in. Uh, hopefully that answered some of the questions you had. Uh, it seems to be the, they seem to be the most common questions I keep getting throughout the build uh, on the various platforms. Um, if you want to, or you've got any questions you want answered, or you need to know where suppliers are used or stuff that I can put you in touch with, uh, just hit me up on Instagram. It's probably the easiest direct message there. Follow and direct message is the easiest way to get in touch with me. Uh, there's also a Facebook page for Perpetual Transient. Um, I don't do much there other than just drop the links into the videos each week. So if you want that up in your feed, just go there and hit the like button or follow, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, we're back to episode 15 next week. Um, hopefully you can dial in for the rest of the, uh, episodes 15 through to 20 to finish off the build series. And, uh, then we'll be onto some adventure based stuff, getting this thing out in the bush and getting dirty, hopefully. Um, yeah, but anyway, cheerio for now. Thanks for dialing in.